All right, today we're going to be talking about the ancient Etruscans. So we're going to go there. And as we know, the Etruscans dominated uh, the Italian peninsula from around 900 to 300 BCE. They were effectively uh, and thoroughly uh, conquered by the Romans, uh, but in so doing, uh, the Romans of being the consistent utilitarian society that they really were, uh, absorbed much of their religion, their culture, uh, and um, their technology. Uh, for example, I know we always think of the Romans in connection with the arch. Well, the Etruscans came up with the arch. I know we think about the uh, Romans in connection with cement. Nope, the Etruscans came up with cement. We think of the Romans with this elaborate knowledge of hydraulics and aqueducts, raised aqueducts and so forth, and reservoirs and sewers. Nope, that was the Etruscans. We think of the Romans in connection to plan, uh, town planning. And no, that was the Etruscans. I mean, yeah, they, they took a lot. But the Etruscans, in turn, took a lot from other groups, too, with their culture. And so you're going to find uh, not only autochthonic markings of their culture, but connections with Crete and Asia Minor, uh, and Phoenicia and Cyprus, and of course, Greece. Uh, their language has not been fully deciphered, but it was written in a Greek uh, script. Uh, and so, but we do know that it was non-Indo-European. Uh, we do know that uh, uh, there is the, uh, the, the war, the kind of, um, uh, kind of war boots with turned up clothes, which I find is interesting because we know the Hittites and the Hurrians uh, wore those. Their art was influenced very much by uh, Crete and, and Cyprus, as I mentioned. It's interesting because they oftentimes colored uh, their men red or brown and women were lighter in much the same way as we see on Crete and other places. So that's interesting. Uh, but there is also influences uh, in some of the megalithic styles that we see from Corsica and Sardinia. I mean, really, it's fascinating. They've always intrigued me. And I've had a chance to uh, go to uh, Etruscany or Tuscany, <laughs> and I have explored some of the sites. So that's, you know, it's, they're, they're mysterious. I mean, we know so much, and yet we know, uh, well, of course, so little. So let's talk about the origins. Oh, now, of course, now I just dive into the mess. <laughs> it's like, oh, where do they come from? And, uh, you know, you, you, go, you Google and you find one answer and then you look again, you find another. And they keep updating and changing where the mysterious Etruscans arrive from. And there are three different basic origins. Uh, one is, of course, the Eastern Mediterranean origin for the Etruscans. Uh, the second is the northern origin. They come from the north and they move down from there. Uh, Reata, you know, Switzerland area. And the third is that they are autochthonous. They are from that region. Uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, the native aspect, uh, they say they live for a very long time since the, uh, the Neolithic age uh, in north central Italy. That they were there, you know, but then you have others, uh, many, many uh, factors. One, Rosella Lorenzi, uh, well known mm -hmm. Etruscan scholar, and uh, she says, Well, it looks like that they were migrating from the south, and of course, uh, the last version, the Eastern Mediterranean. I want to tell you this uh, I'm really in favor of this one, but. I'm going to give all the exceptions to the rule. So we're going to go there in a little bit. But uh, uh, it looks like that we do have quite a few theories out there for where they arrive from. Uh, but we do know uh, that uh, we find that there are ev there's evidence that uh, from Egyptian and Hittite records, as well as Greek records, uh, that... Um, uh, they may be connected uh, to a group known as the Tarish. And the Tarish are, in many ways, you hear the word Tarish, it's very close, close to the word Terensoi, which uh, is uh, connected to the word Terinian, 
and the Tyrrhenians. You, know, you guys heard of the Tyrrhenian Sea there, <laughs> right? Uh, and that's connected to Etrusia. So there are stories of that as well. Now, um, uh, that means if this is true, that means that the Etruscans could be related to those known as the Sea Peoples. Uh, the Turish are also connected uh, to the Turcha. Uh, in, in you see this in Egyptian records. Uh, for, for example, the uh, Nern, uh, Stile from Egypt, which does record uh, the, the Sea People who are arriving, uh, attacking Egypt. So uh, this is the victory Stile. So this is a possibility as well. But it could be also that they are a mixture of so many different groups. We are going to go there. Don't worry. We're going to go. I'm, I'm not going to settle just to tell you the general overview. I'm going to go into detail DNA-wise. <laughs> so don't worry. <laughs> we'll get there. Okay. So uh, let's let's go back, though. Let's go into uh, now. It is confirmed that sometime between 900 and 800 BCE, a mysterious people called the Etruscans settled on the Italian peninsula. In Attic Greek, the Etruscans were known uh, as the Tyrrhenians. Okay, they were known as the Tyrrhenians. Uh, and so we do have a direct name. The very first reference to the Tyrrhenians, as you're going to ask me that question, aren't you? Uh, is found in Hesiod's Theogony, where he states as follows. Of course, Hesiod's uh, was active between 750 to 650 BCE. So, I mean, this is this is contemporaneous to the Etruscans. This is a great source, uh, and he says, uh, "And they, the sons of Circe." ruled over the famous Tyrrhenians very far off in a recess of the holy islands. There it is. There's the reference right there. Meanwhile, the Homeric hymn to Dionysus from around the 7th century BCE depicts the Tyrrhenians as pirates who seize Dionysus and says, Presently, there came swiftly over the sparkling sea Tercinian pirates on a well-decked ship. A miserable doom led them on. By the time of Pindar, uh, thriving between 522 to 5, 443, excuse me, the Etruscans were specifically associated with those known as the Terence Nye who were viewed as constituting a threat against Magna Graecia. He says, I entreat you, son of Cronus, grant that the battle shouts of the Carthaginians and Etruscans stay quietly at home, now that they have seen their arrogance bring lamentation to their ships of Cume. Wow. So already, I mean, you know, we do have contemporary sources on the Etruscans. It's not like we don't. And already, you can see, they are connected to the Tyrrhenians. We're a little bit further. But uh, I don't know why people argue about this. <laughs> because you're seeing it right here. Okay, let's go further, though. Okay, let's go to Herodotus. Herodotus, uh, 484 to 425. He describes how the Tersonai, this is, no, remember, it's 484 to 425. He is still contemporaneous to the Etruscans. Okay. And he describes how they migrated from Lydia to the land of the Umbrians. Yeah, he describes that. In fact, even Dionysus the Heliconarsis talks about this as well. Uh, in fact, uh, he wrote, this is the first century uh, BCE, he said that the Tyrrhenians were a people of dainty and expensive tastes, hmm. both at home and in the field, carrying about with them, besides the necessities, costly and artistic articles of all kinds designed for pleasure and luxury. We're going to see in the course of this talk, the Etruscans absolutely enjoyed the good life. <laughs> and they, they 
settled in luxury wares. Beyond that, of course, obviously metal alloys and other things too, but uh, they love a good life. If anybody has ever been into a Truscan tomb, I can, <laughs> you can see how they have reveled in life, even though these are these scenes are painted uh, in death, right? For Greek historians as early as the 5th century BCE, the Tyrrhenians uh, were associated with another group. So here we go. Those known as the Pelasgians. The Pelasgians. So memorize that. According to Thucydides and Herodotus uh, and Strabo, the island of Lemnos, located in the northern Aegean, was settled by Pelasgians, who Thucydides identifies as, quote, belonging to the Terencinoi, unquote. And although no, both Strabo and Herodotus agreed, the migration was led by Perennis, the son of Attis, king of Lydia. Strabo specifically uh, says that it was the Pelasgians of Lemnos and Imbros that followed this certain Terenius to Italy, specifically. So we even have an origin story from a specific island. <laughs> Again, you know, today people are still arguing, where did they come from? Um, origin story, contemporaneous <laughs> to the Etruscans. Do we just simply ignore this? Okay, so let's keep on going. Let's talk about Lemnos a little bit. Lemnos, um, it was actually, this island was relatively free uh, from classical influence until the Athenians conquered the island in the latter half of the sixth century. Uh, and that, at that point, Attic Greek replaced the previous language. It turns out that previous language has very strong correlations with, guess what? Ancient Etruscan. <laughs> There's actually what's called the Lemnian Pelasgian Etruscan link that we see what's called in the Lemnostile. We have a Lemnostile. Inscriptions are written in a language that show a very strong structural resemblance to the language of the Etruscans, very much so. And uh, they were found uh, built into a church wall uh, in Caminia. Uh, they are currently in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. Uh, we know it dates from the sixth century. We know it doesn't date any later uh, because in 510 BCE, the Athenians invaded Lemnos and Hellenized it. We take a look at the stele, and um, there's a bust of a helmeted man, and it is described in an alphabet similar uh, to the Western Greek alphabet. Uh, the inscription itself, uh, we can see through transliterations, it's hard to figure out, but we see a direct comparison to the same exact words, even though we can't read them, uh, to Etruscan. In fact, we take a look. Uh, and the inscription can say it consists of 198 characters forming 33 to 40 words. Uh, the word separation is sometimes indicated by a dot. The S consists of three parts, uh, and uh, but uh, there are connections. Uh, we, what we can read of Etruscan, what we can read of the Limnos monument, I'm going to give you an example right now. <laughs> okay, so here we are. So uh, there is, okay, so in the, on the stele, uh, there is a phrase that means aged 60, as in 60 years old. So we have, we're able to transliterate it sound wise uh, on the stele, see if you hear a commonality. Uh, in the stele itself, in Lemnos, it, it reads as follows, avis silicvis, aged 60. Okay, so let's read uh, the Etruscan. Evils maxi silicus. <laughs> I don't know, it sounds pretty close to me. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> really close, but still people fight. <laughs> so uh, to me, uh, that sounds too similar just to say, hey, this is a coincidence. And this is just one of many. Are you guys getting this? So it looks like there is even a linguistic tie 
uh, with lemons. I always find that interesting. So, further, because you know they always focus on lemons. And, well, archaeologists have worked there. Um, uh, started in 1927, and what they, what, what they realized, looking at the discoveries, that uh, there is a strong connection to Mycenaean culture all the way up to the time when the Athenians took over in their artwork, in their paintings. So you can see that there's a strong tie already with these earlier Bronze Age sculptures going right in uh, to the Iron Age. And I find that also extremely uh, exciting. So, and the other part that I think is fun uh, is that um, there's some Greeks that connect uh, the island of Lemnos with the Pelasgians. So we have another crossover there. You know, there are the Iranians from there. And whoa, lo and behold, so are the Pelasgians. Wait, maybe they're the same people. And maybe not. So uh, let's talk about the Pelasgians. Now we have this kind of connected in our minds. Um, the Pelasgians, um, they're, they're mentioned in the Iliad. They're mentioned as allies of those of ancient Troy. And so we see them, uh, and according to the Iliad, the Pelasgians were camping out on the shore together with the following tribes. Towards the seas lies the Carians and the and the uh, Pions with curved bows, and the Lilligates and the Cockbones, and the goodly Pelasgians. There we go. The Odyssey also mentions the Pelasgians. Uh, so there you have it uh, in connection with ancient Crete. Later Greek writers offer uh, other evidence uh, concerning, like for example, the Pelasgians are connected to the famous Oracle of Dodona which is the famous oaks where Zeus speaks from. Uh, we have also uh, Asclepides uh, talking about this too. In fact, it turns out the Pelasgians are sometimes connected with those who were there before the Dorians in Greek, and they dominated Eastern Greek, especially Argos, and the Peloponnese all the way up, that they're the earlier culture. But this culture, the Pelasgians, do extend into the Asian islands and then do, of course, extend into Asia Minor. And so these are these earlier people. And that makes sense. This is making it right that a group of them would migrate, possibly during the end of the Bronze Age, possibly connected to the Sea Peoples. And you can even see the Troy connection. This is fascinating. I love how all these things just kind of fall like dominoes. I don't know. But uh, so there you have it. Um, uh, moving right along, uh, we, we kind of go into, of course, there's a lot of Argos. I want to make sure that we, uh, I can get into this topic forever. But uh, moving on, wow, this is just too much interesting stuff here. Oh, I wish I could keep it. Okay, so, all right, all right. And I says, last, I got like three pages, four pages of Pelasgians alone. Um, and, um, and I need to keep going because there's so much in connection with it. Okay. So one more thing I want to bring up, because I got I got to bring in some scholars on this. As far as the Pelasgians, but especially the connection to Anatolia, we do have many reputable uh, scholars that make this connection uh, to this culture, uh, going back all the way uh, to Anatolia. And one is, of course, the famous archaeologist of Chattahuya by the name of James Millard. So, as well as Fritz Schaumeyer. So I'm not the only one talking about this. <laughs> uh, there are others going into this. Also, the Pelasgians, you can always recognize, uh, many archeologists and linguistics have recognized this, the, the root names of many places connected to Pelasgians who are before other Dorians and other groups. And that is, if the word has an N-T-H in towards its ending, we see this, of course, like in Corinth, the double P, as well as the N, sorry, E-N-A-I. And so these are all place names uh, that date earlier. Okay, so we have that. Now, let's move on to uh, the next little bit here. And that is the, uh, the Etruscans themselves called themselves Irasena. 
Arasa, Arasa. And Pliny the Elder put the Etruscans in connection to the Raetic peoples to the north and says so in his natural history. And uh, he says, adjoining these, the Alpine Noricans are the Raete and the Ventilici. All are divided into a number of states. The Raete are believed to be the people of Tuscan race and driven out by the Gauls. Their leader was named Raetis. And so the idea is the Raetic were a confederation of Alpine tribes whose language and culture were derived uh, from further to the north. And then, of course, they migrated south. And uh, of course, um, that's interesting. But we see another word, which kind of throws people off. And you see the word, and that is the Tuscan or Tuscan. You know, of course, we think of Star Wars and Tuscan warriors. So what is, what is, where, is, where, is, where does this word come from, Tuscan? So we take a look, and uh, we find this, for example, in the Ugbine tablet, which is a major source for the Umbrian language. The phrase Turkscum, uh, the Tuscan name we find here, its root is Turski. And of course, what happens is this, the Turski in this language, uh, in Umbrian, but as well as we, we believe in ancient Etruscan, it is the Turski, but when you emphasize something in that language, hold on, let's see where we're going. There is a word initial, uh, epenthesis, that's produced. And so it starts with an e. So as opposed to the Turski, it becomes the e Turski, e Turski. You're seeing where we're going with this one. And then it becomes Etruski, and then it becomes Etruscan. Is that good? You guys got that? So the E is an emphasis <laughs> that is connected to the word Tuscan. Got it? Etruscan. Etruscan. Now, again, I'm giving you how this word came about, but what does it mean? Well, uh, some will say, that uh, it is connected, uh, that it is a word, since the Etruscans call themselves Ariete, this is a name that was imposed upon them. And some will say that it's connected to the word, Latin word, purus, which means power, or, or pursus, power. And, be, and we do know that uh, the Romans view the Etruscans as those who build the towers, uh, Etruscan cities, uh, built on hilltops, were notorious for having these tall towers. In fact, even today in central Italy, you will see these tall towers uh, in places like San Gimiano, right? You see these tall towers that continued on, the medieval version of it. That's a possibility. But then again, we don't know. <laughs> I'd say that's guesswork, right? Yeah, it's towers. That's working. But of course, uh, we get another word for this. Uh, and that is, of course, you know, the, the name of the region, Tuscany, right? Tuscany is the same root. So Tuscany is simply, when you go to Tuscany today, that's simply the land of the Etruscans. You just add the, we could, we could even call it Etruscany if you wanted to, or Etruscany. <laughs> so, so maybe if you want to go to Tuscany, but you're going to focus on the Etruscan sites, say we're going to Etruscany, and, and you know, let me be delve in a little deeper there. Okay, good. All right, so there you have it. Now, again, am I giving an answer yet? Well, there's more. There's more. Yeah. You're going to give an answer where these Etruscans are from. Of course I am. I'm going to do it right now. Where are they from? Let's move to science. Okay, so we have, uh, when it comes to genetics, we take a look. And uh, we, first of all, the first examination we'll look at, there's four different proofs. The first one uh, is looking at the mitochondrial DNA. They looked at it through 14 individuals buried in two Etruscan uh, necropolises. 
and they analyzed it as, along with other Etruscan and medieval samples. Uh, and 4,910 contemporary individuals from the Mediterranean Basin. And they compared all this together and uh, did lots of computer uh, simulations. And it looks like that uh, there was absolutely an Anatolian date that goes back 5,000 years ago. So 5,000 years ago, there, you know, there was a connection. Now, you do the, do the math 5,000 years ago. It's like, well, this is, you know, past the 2000s. There, as early as the 3000s, you have people coming from the Anatolian region into this region. Hope this helps. So there are, so in other words, we're having migrations coming from the east early on. And that's just simple DNA, right? So let's go a little further on the rabbit hole. One study was based on the mitochondria DNA of residents of a certain place known as Merlot. Uh, uh, it's a small Etruscan town, it's way out of the way. Uh, these people have been intermarrying with each other for, for centuries. So because they're isolated. So this is this is great to see, you know, how long this uh, uh, you know, see maybe more of a purity. Taking a look at this, <laughs> what they found is the residents' lineages uh, were different from other Italian towns, and the lineages go back to the Eastern Mediterranean, including not only Asia Minor, Anatolia, but even into Syria. <laughs> it's like, whoa, wait. <laughs> okay, that is isolated. So they, they're just like, well, okay. So are you starting to see where we're going with the DNA? Huh. Let's go to the third source. The third source, we take a look here. Uh, a certain Marco Elitia uh, from the Catholic University of the Sacred Heart in Pianzen. Uh, they look at, I love this, they go, let's take a look, not at people, let's take a look at cattle. Where are the cows from? <laughs> well, they did this, the DNA samples, and it turns out the Tuscan breeds genetically were from the Near East. You got Near East and Anatolian cattle today, <laughs> city of the heart of, of the Tuscany. <laughs> and apparently they, they, they are not doing too much crossbreeding for all these thousands of years. Is, is this helping, right? Is this, is this enough? And of course, uh, fourth, uh, there's a research done at Pavi University and uh, it takes a look and the DNA sample show, shows that uh, there's 322 mitochondrial DNA versions, but the central area was Lydia versus Anatolia. Uh oh, so we have these four proofs. But having said that, stepping back, these groups, so it looks like there's one group that, you know, came over earlier on, Neolithic era. Are you seeing this? Actually, you know, and then the next group uh, that comes over. Uh, and another group comes over from Anatolia, and they, apparently they bring their cows with them. <laughs> it's like, we're not leaving the cows home. Uh, they're going, and then of course, uh, uh, you have the initial Lydian source, which I think is the one that the Greeks are remembering. Uh, the Tyrrhenians are leaving Lydia in this region. And so we have, written, so can we stop arguing now? <laughs> Fighting over this fact? You know, were there people that came from the North? Of course they, there were. And they intermarry people. That's what we do, <laughs> you know. So, so people are coming from the north. They're intermarrying. Do they intermarry with indigenous people? Of course they did. Uh, you know, I, I I never understood the absolutist mentality. It's like they all come indigenous. They're all from the north, or they're all from the eastern Mediterranean. Just do the DNA, and you realize that we're just a big soup of different blends, uh, and uh, and we're all right. Okay. Well, now that I hopefully maybe solve that problem, maybe not, but uh, there you have it. Uh, let's take a look. And we know that um, the Etruscans, uh, their language was believed to be non-Indo-European. So they are connected to people that were before. Uh, and of course, that would make sense if they do have like a or so Minoan or Pulaskian roots, right? They, they arrived before the Indo-European sweep. So that makes a lot of sense. So there you have it. We take a look at the, 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 you know, the art. 
obviously, uh, and religion. There's lots of influence there. Now, um, moving right along, according to the Libri Fatalis, as described by Censorinius, uh, around exactly 968 BCE, um, they supposedly, the people arrived from Etrusia. That's a little too specific for me, but this is according to uh, ancient reckoni uh, reckoning. Uh, and But we know from archaeology that there was a drift from a scattered village settlements uh, to these, these major centers. And then with the increase of trade and the specialization of crafts and the application of new technologies, which we will talk about soon, uh, especially extracting of metal and they're very good at agriculture. The living standards uh, for the uh, Etruscans get better. I mean, life is good for the Etruscans. Then, yes, we do have Greek immigrants. They do arrive uh, and they bring their specific uh, knowledge to, uh, the, uh, to the Etruscans. We see this through all the trade goods that we find in various sites. And so there you have it. And eventually the Etruscans dominate the Italian peninsula from the plains around the Po River all the way down to Campania uh, in the south. This is a really rich and wonderful land. Uh, now, they did create a great uh, navy. We know this. Uh, in fact, uh, they dominated the Tyrrhenian Sea and continued uh, into the Mediterranean. And so they were, they were quite formidable after a while. In fact, some sources say that they dominated much of the Western Mediterranean and obviously found themselves in conflict with the Carthaginians. Eventually, they get down and they conquer Rome. Now, we know that we have the seven the famous kings of Rome, but the last three of which happen to be Etruscan. Uh, one of them uh, was known as Tarquinius Priscus. Love this story. Uh, this is the first of the new Carthaginian kings to take over Rome. Uh, and he was said to come from the Etruscan city of Tarquini. Uh, the story is told that as he approached the city, an eagle came from the sky and lifted his cap from his head and replaced it with another. His wife, uh, who will become a we'll of her soon, who was skilled at the Etruscan art of augury, regarded the eagle as a messenger from heaven and the act that her husband was to be honored as king. Now, he did take over. Uh, he did take over Rome and had waged wars against uh, various enemies on either side. According, however, uh, to tradition, he is the one who drained the swamp of the city he improved the forum. He founded the Temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill. It is said that he even built the Circus Maximus. Uh, so, you know, he's also the one uh, supposedly that introduced what's called the Fasces into the Roman uh, system. Uh, of course, the Fasces, this is the bundle of wooden rods that we see together. Uh, sometimes there's an axe and a blade that emerge on top. Etruscan artifacts do indeed show that there, this symbol was used by the Etruscans, uh, showing a thin bundle of rods surrounded by a two-headed axe. This two-headed axe, uh, which is a, a labrys, from, from which you get the word labyrinth, right? But the labyrinth turns out, guess where this originally come, came from? <laughs> I'll give you a few seconds as I drink some water. That's right, Anatolia. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, they brought along with them. Uh, and so uh, by the time of the Roman Republic, the Fasces had developed into a thicker bundle of, of birch rods, sometimes surrounding a single headed axe and tied together with a red leather ribbon. Uh, the idea is that the axe represented the power over life and death through the death penalty, but also the idea that uh, one one reed cannot be broken, but a bundle of reed, reeds can be broken, right? So that makes you stronger. And you know what happens? It ends up on the back of our dime. 
Yes, well, American money, if you're pro-American. Uh, it's, it's, it's the dime. Yeah, that's the Fassi symbol. So I find that that's fascinating. And of course, after that, the next one was uh, Servius Tullius, the next king. Uh, he was said to build the Temple of Diana on Aventine Hill. And uh, then after that, uh, the final Etruscan king and the final king of all, uh, his name was Tarquinius Superbus. I'm going to stop there for a second. Tarquinius Superbus. Never name your kid that. <laughs> the egotistical maniac right there. It's like anything has superbus at the end. Okay. So Tarquinius Superbus, uh, he loved pomp and power. Uh, he was horrendous, although he did bring sublime books, um, you know, to, to Rome. And that was kind of cool. Uh, but the later on in life, he was scared out of his wits because he was such a terrible ruler uh, that he was going to lose uh, his power. Um, and he had strange dreams. Uh, so he sent his two sons with his nephew Brutus to consult the Greek oracle at Delphi. And the Greek or oracle asked, you know, uh, asked the question of them and said that, uh, that uh, you know, the first person who kissed his mother should succeed the power of the Tarquin. So the first person to kiss mama uh, will succeed after Tarquinius Superbus. I mean, after all, he brought, you know, his two sons there and nephew Brutus. Well, you know, the story goes is that Brutus immediately falls to the ground and kisses the earth. Because after, after all, the earth is the ultimate mother. <laughs> and so Brutus becomes, uh, he becomes an excellent power in the year 509. And he, of course, brings about the famous Roman Republic overthrowing the kings. I love that story. I'm sorry. I had to throw that one in. <laughs> okay. All right. So the Etruscans, they live uh, in independent uh, fortified city-states. Uh, they form these small confederacies. In the earliest times, these city-states were ruled by a monarch. Then they moved into oligarchies uh, governed by a council and eventually, yeah, through elected officials. Now, not all of them. Uh, just like you see in Greece with city-states, you have different different kinds of, uh, of political organizations. But again, most of them became oligarchies, if not partial uh, democracies uh, eventually. So it's happening. Okay. Now, there are 12 basic Etruscan settlements known as the Etruscan League or Etruscan Federation or the Dodo Capitalists. You know, the uh, twelve, uh, and uh, that was. They were. I won't mention them all. Well, I'll mention a few. You have Vai and and Voltula and Volterra and Velsna and so forth. They like bees for their names. Like the surrounding peoples, the Etruscans were largely an agrarian people, uh, but they also had a strong military and used that military to dominate much of the surrounding areas. But they were also expert engineers, city planners. And architects, as I mentioned, uh, they they master the use of of hydraulic engineering, uh, even sewers. Did you know that beneath Rome, right now, the Cloclea Magna, yeah, the, the great sewer under Rome, was built by the Etruscans. Did you know it still works? It's still used as a sewer to this day. 2,500 years later, that's a mark of genius, right? The idea of the raised aqueducts, that was the Etruscans. We always give the Romans uh, the credit, you know, Pope de Gord, de Gord in, in France and so forth. That's, that's the Etruscans. And so there you have it. Uh, they were also uh, experts when it came uh, to uh, farming techniques and even dry farming, maximizing the use of water. Uh, the Etruscans, of course, as I said, used the arch, uh, they used cement. Uh, they typically built on the top of hills. The steeper, the better. Uh, surrounded by thick walls. Uh, so they're, they liked sporting events, just like later on the Romans. In fact, uh, the Roman gladiatorial combat originated as a religious event from the Etruscans. That's where they got it. Didn't know, you know. Now, even the Romans claimed that they adopted this from the Etruscans. Uh, the idea was that there should be a rite of sacrifice 
due to the spirits of the dead, and they need to perpetuate them with offerings of blood. So traditionally, there was a munera. Uh, there was this, this offering, this contest that was fought sometimes before the tomb, sometimes at the funeral, sometimes after, but it was supposed to be appeasing death in a sense. Now, now, it's interesting, and we even see this with the Greeks. Uh, uh, remember uh, the Iliad, uh, the contest uh, that's thrown from Patroclus, right? So, but, but the Etruscans, what they did is they had this, they didn't have a contest between, between people who were fighting one another in this big duel. But you know what the Etruscans did? The Etruscans then, you know, whoever won, that was great, but they didn't kill everybody. <laughs> what? Yeah. So even though it was largely symbolic, it was the Romans that turned it into a gladiatorial contest into something that is bloodthirsty. Uh, basically, it's like they fought the, they fought each other. There was blood sh shed, and that was that, you know. But uh, when the Romans introduced this idea of big not bloody, uh, it was always introduced to Rome in the year 264 in honor uh, when the sons of Junius Brutus honored their father uh, by matching three pairs of gladiators, and then it just got more bloodthirsty as, as time goes on. So anyway, a Etruscan art, a beautiful, figurative, you know, cast, in, you know, bronze, wall painting, metalworking. Uh, interestingly enough, the tombs typically were not dedicated or huge tombs. I've seen a few. But they're dedicated to families more than to individuals. The family was a central key uh, to the Etruscans uh, in, in ways that, uh, you know, uh, that I can't emphasize enough. Uh, obviously, they, they love music. Pipe music was popular. The center of society, we know from Roman sources and, of course, from the art, was the married couple. The Tusather, uh, the Etruscans, um, they valued the, 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 the husband, wife, or the married couple. Um, however, at the same time, uh, they were a very open society. We'll go there in a little bit. But still, the center is husband and wife and the children. And the husband and wife are equal. What? Wait, 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 wait. What? 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 Step back. Don't worry. We'll go there. So, uh, of course, obviously, Etruscan society was class ranked. There's aristocracy. Some people say not much of a middle class. I would disagree because they had a huge merchant class. Last night check, that's a middle class. <laughs> and, of course, you have the agrarian. Now, let's talk about, okay, all right, I, I tease enough. Let's talk about the Etruscan. Let's talk about those Etruscan women, right? So here we go. The Etruscan women, whether married or unmarried, were free. Sarcophagi display uh, their uh, had this, this this aura of this self confidence and displays of of, of, of of affection and love with their male partners. And I think it's interesting is that they are oftentimes on the coffin lids. You take a look. You can Google this. Propped up side by side with their husbands, upright in this full, this full sense of absolute equality. In some cases, looking into each other's eyes. I find that pretty amazing. In fact, uh, women took part, as we know, in public events. Women were involved in the city councils. Women also competed as nude athletes. <laughs> women were also rulers of the Etruscans. And we, I'll, I'll describe a grave in a little bit. This is fascinating. Now, but of course, the thing is, is that uh, this was viewed as scandalous to, uh, to the rest of the world, uh, very upsetting, uh, the liberty that they enjoyed. Uh, in fact, uh, unfortunately, uh, amongst the Romans and the Greeks, uh, the word Etruscan was also sometimes synonymous with the word prostitute. What? Well, I mean, you know, they're free, so 
and then the mines go on these different places. So, uh, so that's a problem here. Uh, in fact, they oftentimes uh, compared uh, the virtuous Roman women uh, who are model wives comparison to those liberated Etruscan counterparts. You know, and see this in literature. So here we go. I'm going to give you a source, and we're going to have to go through it. <sighs> All right. And you'll like you'll you'll enjoy it, but it's it's upsetting at times. But you can see here from the source what people thought of the Etruscan women. His name is Theopompus. He's from Chios. This is from the fourth century BCE. So he is contemporaneous to the Etruscans. So he's a contemporaneous source. It's not like later on afterthought. This is during the time when the Etruscans are around. He writes as follows about the Etruscan women. Now, I, I, sorry, do I believe all of this? No. <laughs> so, but we have to read through it because you got to hear the perception. Sharing wives already, <laughs> the sharing wives, you see the problem here. But sharing wives is an established Etruscan custom. Etruscan women take particular care of their bodies and exercise often sometimes along with the men and sometimes by themselves. Oh no, how scandalous is that? <laughs> wow, these women, uh, you know, they take care of their bodies. Can you believe it? And they, and they exercise, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you're already going, okay, stop. <laughs> but you're seeing already, you know, this is scandalous to them, you know? By the way, uh, before I continue with the source, uh, they're also known uh, to drink with the men all the time and share their meals side by side. Okay, let's continue with the source. It is not a disgrace for them to be seen naked. And, uh, you know, Theopompus, obviously this is the, the same period, so yeah. They do not share their couches with their husbands. It's supposed to be only, but whatever. But the source kind of got rid of that word. But with other men who happen to be present, present and they propose toasts to anyone they choose. That toasting as far as, you know, you toast to somebody. Yay! They're so free speech, right? They are expert drinkers and very attractive. I like that line right there. <laughs> what does it mean to be an expert drinker? But uh, apparently they are expert drinkers in the same sentence and very attractive. So, okay. All right, so this is all this is all really bad so far, right? Um, all right, the Etruscan raise all the children that are born without knowing who their fathers are. The children live the way their parents live, often attending drinking parties and having sexual relations with all the women. So here we go. Now we're getting to the gossip. It is no disgrace for them to do anything in the open or to be seen having it done to them. For they consider it a native custom. Now, obviously, this is exaggerated, but with that said, there's enough truth to the fact that these women are very open, right? You're understanding, and it's causing a stir. So far from thinking it disgraceful, they say when someone asks to see the master of the house and he is making love, and he is doing so and so, calling the indecent action by its name. When they are having sexual relations, either with courtesans or within their family, they do as follows. After they have stopped drinking and are about to go to bed, while the lamps are still lit, servants bring in courtesans or boys or sometimes even their wives. And when they have enjoyed these, they bring in boys and make love to them. They sometimes make love and have intercourse while people are watching them. But most of the time, they put screens woven of sticks around the beds and throw cloths on top of them. They are keen on making love to women, but they particularly enjoy also boys and youths. The youths in Etrusia are very good looking because they live in luxury and keep their bodies smooth. In fact, all the barbarians in the West use pitch to pull out and shave off the hair off their bodies. Okay, so you get the idea, you know, they're just clean shaven. They haven't quite invented there yet, but they're using pitch <laughs> to keep their bodies smooth. But you still get even if it's all scandalous, you still get a very good picture, right, of the fact that these women have a lot of freedom and they're not prudes. They don't, you know, when it comes to sexuality, they're very open. 
uh, in many ways. Now, let's keep going down this rabbit hole. Some Roman writers, uh, you know, talk about the fact that um, uh, that they, um, again, you know, they, 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 they balance out this, the fact that they are, are unchaste to the fact that Roman women are very, you know, <laughs> very faithful, supposedly, right? Uh, you have also uh, Athenaeus, a Greek grammarian of the third century CE, says among the Etruscans who had become extravagantly luxurious, it is customary for slave girls to wait on the men naked. I mean, you got tons of this kind of stuff. Okay, let's let's okay, so that's good enough. We got the stories. Let's take a look at the evidence from the ground. Okay. For a more unbiased and maybe authentic view of the Etruscans, we turn to archaeology. What does it have to say? What does the material culture have to say? Women and men in the archaeological source uh, seem to have relatively gender equality as portrayed in funerary ceramics and a sarcophagus. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you have uh, these superb sculptures, which I've seen quite often, showing couples reclining together, uh, very affectionate, very relaxed. The women speaking, sometimes shown as gesturing in speech, right? There's also scenes that show females together uh, showing affection to one another. Um, in fact, there's one that's one painting that shows women who lay together, faces very close as if kissing. We see depicted women pipers. We see women as ecstatic dancers, but we also see women portrayed as warriors. And what I find is interesting is the Etruscans love Amazons. They love Amazon women, and they decorate uh, their tombs with Amazon Amazonian kinds of things. But what I find is fascinating is a comparison to what we see in Greece, where the, the Amazons are being oftentimes being defeated. In the Etruscan culture, they're shown as victorious. <laughs> they're winning. Uh, I think that's interesting. You know, we see also, of course, that um, let's go somewhere else. That the Greeks they had wonderful pottery. And what they used to do is they shipped out a certain kind of pottery that was very popular in, Etru in, in, in Etrusia. Uh, and that happened to be pottery that depicted women, uh, you know, portrayed in doing various feats within mythology or just regular scenes from life. And it shows that there's even a demand from the Etruscans from Greece to have these kinds of images which I find is also fascinating. Uh, you, there's also uh, other anomalies that we see uh, here and there. Um, and of course, uh, we have, um, I want to keep going on here, but um, uh, oh, okay, so let's go to a discovery uh, that recently happened. Uh, they found on one platform, a skeleton bearing a lance on the other, a partially incinerated skeleton within this tomb. And they assumed that the, the skeleton with the lance was the man, and the other next to it was the woman. It turned out it was vice versa. They mixed it up. It was the woman that was that was had the lance, and the man was buried with her. <laughs> so here you have this like, and of course, you know. The Italian archaeologists are going crazy over this. Well, there must have been some kind of other reason for this, uh, you know, and because, you know, a little bit more conservative when it comes to their perspective, not sure, you know, they say, well, she must have been a really high status and, and so forth and so on. But I find uh, that uh, interesting. And of course, obviously, uh, they have found uh, an image uh, of a, a, um, Etruscan queen, uh, that is pretty amazing. Uh, but uh, we don't have time to go through all that, but you get the idea, right? So, okay, so let's go into the Etruscan beliefs. So Etruscan beliefs, they believe in what was understood as imminent polytheism. 
uh, basically all visible phenomena was considered uh, to be manifestations of divine power. And that power in turn was subdivided into deities who, uh, who extended into the realm of men. I found the best quote by Seneca the Younger concerning their beliefs. And I'm going to say this quote very slowly, but it does kind of describe the difference between Romans and Etruscans in this way. He says, whereas we, being Romans, believe lightning to be released as a result of the collision of clouds, they believe that the clouds collide so as to release lightning. For as they attribute all to the deity, they are led to believe not that things have meaning in so far as they occur, but rather they occur because they must have a meaning. <laughs> Isn't that good? Right? Uh, especially that last part, they are led to believe not that things have a meaning insofar as they occur, but rather they occur because they must have a meaning. Therefore, everything in the universe has meaning. The, the universe is animated through spirit in every way, telling them what is to happen. So religion, uh, you see how this is, is, is very much animistic, has this ancient feeling uh, to it. Uh, but they developed, as a result, these complicated rituals for divining the future, which they then handed down uh, to the Romans. Uh, but the idea is basically the destiny of, of man, of humanity, was completely determined uh, uh, through uh, looking at or inspecting the phenomena around them. Every natural phenomena, such as lightning, structure of the internal organs of sacrificial animals or, or even the flight patterns of birds was therefore an expression of the divine will. Everything contained a message which could be interpreted by those known as the augurs, uh, these, these priests. Now, let's go deeper. Yes, uh, in Etruria, as in the ancient East, uh, religious and secular knowledge didn't exist. One melted into the other, right? So, so that means is that everything was all connected and they looked to, first of all, the four quarters of the sky. The four quarters of the sky. The orientation of this space. So there was this in a sense, this cross, they looked at the sky and they saw this cross above, north, south, right? East and west, it was all divided into these four quadrants. What I think is interesting is these four quadrants of the sky as above reflect down below. And so they even designed their cities and later on the Romans, based on this cross pattern that was above. So you have, of course, this north-south axis way that's called a cardo in Latin, and the east-west line called a decumanus, right? And of course, you see cardos everywhere in these cities. So as above, so below. The heavens and the earth were imagined as quartered by this invisible cross. And, uh, and here you have the cosmic station to the gods. So what were each, what were the meaning behind each area? The east was considered the realm of the good. So the eastern section of that cross was the realm of the good. So good augur. There are good things that happen when you look to the east. Here is where resided the highest of all the deities. They resided in the East. Those who favored humanity, good fortune, right? They chose, they, they chose to dwell here. Now, the luckiest section of the sky was the Northeast. 
this is the promise of the greatest of fortunes uh, favorable uh, to humanity. And, uh, and so if they would see lightning coming from this region, or they would see birds coming from this region, right? This means good things are coming. Good things are happening, right? Now, in the south, the gods of earth rule. So the southern section, gods of earth rule. These gods were terrible, merciless. They were connected again uh, to the underworld and, of course, fate, uh, right? Now, it gets worse because the darkest realm was the realm of the West, especially the quarter. Uh, I'm going to say this, especially the quarter between uh, the South and the West. Now, I have found some Etruscan scholars saying, no, it was the North and the West. And uh, I've, read, I've gone through the debates, and I think it's because when you're looking at lightning, a lot of the lightning occurs uh, in the northern part of the sky in Italy, and so that's what, how they read things. But for the most part, it was the major storms having to arrive off of Italy, if you're familiar with Italy, right, uh, from southwest. So that's where all the terrible things come from, is where these roaring stores, storms come. Also, if you live in Iowa, <laughs> in the Midwest, you watch out for the Southwest. <laughs> so, so there, that's the terrible area, right? So there we go. So uh, the diviner, uh, diviner's right, the West, the right side was the West. This was known as the pars hostilis, the enemy part, considered unlucky. And then, of course, the left was the pars familiaris, the friendly part, lucky. Uh, the quarters made uh, basically were also um, subdivided amongst the various gods. We'll go there. So, so who came up with this idea? Well, you know, the Etruscans, you're never going to hear this anywhere else. You won't. Or at least nobody finds it interesting enough. <laughs> the Etruscans actually have a founding father for uh, their mysteries. Who oh, no. knew? Yeah. Yeah, his name uh, is Tagus. Tagus. Uh, he is a childlike figure born from the tilled land, uh, and he is immediately uh, gifted uh, with um, uh, knowledge, but also it was in turn also founded by a female figure by the name of Vigoya. So you have a male and a female founders of the mysteries of the Etruscans. Tagus was the prophet of the Etruscan uh, stories. According to legend, Tagus appeared at Pal time and taught the Etruscans divination. Uh, Cicero reports the myth. He says, they tell us that one day, as a land was being piled in the territory of Tarquini, and a deep furrow, furrow than usual, was made, suddenly Tagus sprang out of it and addresses the plowman. Uh, Tagus is recorded as putting together these first works. Uh, he was oftentimes shown in the visage of a child, but he was a sage. He was just like the child prophet <laughs> giving the mysteries of the Etruscans. Uh, so he created the science of the soothsayers, right? So there you have it. And of course, Bogoya, uh, who is she? She was understood as either a sibyl or a nymph, right? Uh, and she's the one who provided the Etruscans the written sacred books, uh, as well as creating the rules and rituals of landmarking and presiding over observance, respect, and the preservation of boundaries. So you have, I love this, this is the typical Etruscan way you have a male and female founder. <laughs> uh, and they're both kind of magical in so many different ways. So, okay. So, Going on to this, obviously, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Okay, so there we go. So what is haroscus? The idea of haroscus. This is a method of divination. Uh, it was practiced by the ancient Etruscans, uh, but it was a practice, of course, obviously by the Romans later on. But this art goes back uh, to the Mesopotamian culture uh, and other cultures at the same time. So it does go back quite a ways. Aruspices or diviners from Etrusia, 
uh, were active even throughout Roman history. So this is, this is important. When the Etruscans end, and they don't end, they just intermarry, they're still there. You go to Etruscan in May, congratulations, you're seeing Etruscans. <laughs> It'll go away. They just kind of like, okay, well, somebody took us over. Uh, but, um, but the religion, uh, the, the, the augury continued throughout Roman times and even into the early medieval period. There's evidence. Uh, even one story from the fifth century, uh, uh, the prefect of Rome offered uh, the idea that uh, maybe against the barbarians, maybe we should do some kind of ritual near 408. Uh, and of course, um, what happened is to the gospel innocent, uh, the Christian bishop says, okay, well, maybe we'll do that. Just don't make a big deal over it. But uh, eventually uh, it started to slip away. So what did they do? So the diviner interprets the divine uh, through the entrails of the sacrificed animal. First, number one, I, you know, I'll go on the specifics. First, the animal was richly slaughtered. Next, it was butchered with the horospix examining the size, the shape, the color, and the markings of the internal organs, usually the liver, but also the gall, the heart, and the lung, lung. Looking for anomalies. And through these anomalies, you can read what the future is. We do have a model of a liver, the liver of Piacenza. Uh, it's an Etruscan artifact. It was found in the field on September 26, 1877. It is a life-size bronze model of a sheep's liver covered in Etruscan inscriptions. Uh, and uh, we take a look. The liver is subdivided into sections for the purposes of performing uh, horospicy. The sections are inscribed with the names of the individual Etruscan deities, which I think is pretty interesting. We have some earlier ones from Babylonian times too. The outer rim of this liver is divided into 16 sections. Since according to the testimony, testimony excuse me, of Pliny and Cicero, the Etruscans divided the heavens into 16 astrological houses. And so the liver represents the model of the cosmos. And the, not only the model of the cosmos in each of the 16 sections connected to a different god, but also to 16 astrological signs. Isn't that interesting, right? And so you're going to see if there's an anomaly in any of those sec 16 sections, you'll be able to see it, right? And then you know, okay, something's going wrong in this particular section under this sign, under this god or goddess. And then from there, using other variables, you'll be able to tell or read the future. Uh, so these are dwelling places. Uh, in fact, so uh, for example, tin. Uh, the main god of lightning has his dwelling place due north as lightning in the northeast section of this particular. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, it's also divided into, of course, the, the directional areas. So are we, are we so let, let's go through it. So what happens now? You got the you got the liver. You're reading the liver, and then of course you say something like "tular esnai sa." <laughs> uh, Aesne is kind of connected to the word deities. It means make the divine boundaries. He'd declare that in Etruscan. Uh, and then, of course, you'd say something like, Ta, Sakni. Uh, this is the sanctuary. And then you say, Ak, Aesne, Merisin, Vako, which is offer the water as libation for the gods. <laughs> How's that? How's the way? Ancient Etruscan, pretty good. Okay. So that's how you kind of start out there. So now the Hierospix faces south. They face southward. They stretch out their hands and a loud voice implore the gods to give an omen. So they will say, <laughs> Ablu, Phobius, Apollo, Delian, Pythian, Lord of Delphi, Guardian of the Sibyls. Obviously, this was done in Roman times. And it goes on and on. I mean, I have the whole thing there, but, you know, they make their proclamation. Uh, they would say, Thun, Serme, Tevi, show signs here now. 
All right, so now we, we, we made the declaration facing south. Now the patera is turned, it's a little, obviously the bearing thing, is turned so that the place where the uh, umbilical cord uh, leaves connects to the um, embryo of the southeast direction. And so I'm kind of going too much detail. So just keep it, I actually have everything that there is about them. You can just do your own at home. <laughs> okay. So what happens is that um, uh, you're going to have the, the horospix should note if any region is excessively large or diminished in size or absent, uh, what's called a monstrum or disfigurement in, in, in a part or a quadrant or a region uh, is especially significant and can be an evil omen. All right. And then, of course, I, I do have a ritual of trying to appease and bring this together. I want to make sure we have time for other things. Uh, again, a god was called an ace. A plural is asar. Now, there are, I want to make sure we get here, there are three layers of deities that are evident, uh, that are worshipped amongst the Etruscans. And I do want to, I do want to go into that. So, I have not done my job unless I go into their, their gods and goddesses. And so here we go. So three layers. Okay, so first of all, you have the divinities of an indigenous nature, the one that seemed to be coming from uh, directly the area of central Italy. Uh, then, of course, uh, you have those uh, who are the Indo-European ones that can come later, that's layered over like Tim or Tinia, the sky, and Uni, his wife, and Sel, the earth goddess. And then the third, you have the Greek and Roman gods. So those are the layers, okay? Now let's talk about the lead god. His name is Tinia. Not only lead, he's co-lead. Uh, he was the chief Etruscan god, the ruler of the skies, the husband of Uni, the father of you know, Heracle or Hercules, uh, he is uh, the, the equivalent to the Greek Zeus and the Roman Jupiter, very much so. Uh, he is called Appa, which means father uh, in the inscriptions. Uh, of course, obviously, for the Romans, it's Peter Pater, as in Eupater, right? You know, but uh, for the Etruscans, it's Appa. He is a god of boundaries. He's the god of justice. Uh, he is shown as grasping a stock of thunderbolts in his hands. By the way, you see this motif also in Anatolia, <laughs> amongst the Tarhunas, amongst the storm gods. There you have it. Uh, so these bolts are for three purposes, these bolts. The first one is these bolts are used as a warning. So he'll Tini will throw his bolt as a warning. Number two, good or bad interventions, he will throw his bolts. And number three, drastic catastrophes. Now, you're thinking, okay, just like Zeus. But you know what? I'm sorry. He's not as much of a, I'm not going to say the word jerk, but he's not as bad as Zeus is. Uh, let's put it this way. Did you know that uh, Yes, Tien, he could uh, he could throw his thunderbolt as a as a warning, but for the other two, good or bad interventions and drastic catastrophes, he couldn't do that without consulting the other deities first. Isn't that interesting? He had to have a check and balance. <laughs> so before you destroy the civilization, you gotta check with the other gods. Like what? You know, the Romans know, the Greeks know, but the Etruscans, hey, let's, let's play nice. <laughs> you know, let's, let's hold up a little bit. So what happens uh, is that they consult, he consults with those called the D.I. Consentus, or the consultant gods, as well as the D.I. Involitu, the hidden gods. He has to check through those before he does anything pretty drastic. I like that. <laughs> you know, let's talk about this first. It kind of reflects the uh, Prescott civilization. Uh, he is also connected to wolves and dogs of the underworld, which I think is interesting. Did you know that, that later on, 
Antien becomes part of local Tuscan folklore, and he becomes an evil spirit known as Tigna, who causes lightning strikes and lots of problems, and still is referred to in stories today. <laughs> so now the next one is Uni. Uh, Uni is the great goddess of the Etruscans. Uh, she's very much a mother goddess, birth goddess, star goddess. She's a love goddess. She's connected uh, to Juno. What I but did you know that? <laughs> sorry, that she could wield thunderbolts too. What? Yeah. <laughs> hey, what's good for hubby is good for her. That's right. So she also uh, is 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 shown as throwing thunderbolts, but she has to consult too. I like that. Again, are you seeing the Etruscan civilization? Your understanding is a little different <laughs> than, than the patriarchal uh, other civilizations in so many different ways. Uh, she also protects women. Uh, people are not sure which came first, the word uni or the word you know. You can see that, or you know, right? you can see there's a, there seems to be a connection there. Uh, linguists will say, well, if uni's name, name uh, comes uh, from a Latin, then it means, you, it means young, but most likely uh, the word Juno, you know, comes from uni. And this word in Etruscan, we do know what this word means. It means she who gives. Uni is she who gives. Well, she is connected to Astarte, the goddess Astarte. And you're thinking, wait, the Phoenicians and the Levant and... Okay, so where are you getting this information from them? What? <laughs> wait, from wait from them? You have, wait, where? There is a city known as Pergi. Uh, it's one of the Etruscan cities. And there's a shrine dedicated to Uni. Uh, it's very richly furnished. Uh, and, um, and there, uh, she is a, a mother. Uh, and she's a, one of the childbirth goddess. And she is worshipped also accordingly at that site to as a star as too. Some people say, well, maybe it's because you know of, of maybe Phoenicians that arrived along the coast and they melded the worship together. Uh, maybe it's influenced by the Carthaginians. No matter what, we're still stuck with the evidence that uh, from ancient times on there is a strange uh, ancient Near East connection uh, to Uni. And I love it. <laughs> it just throws everything off. Um, you know, Uni was um, uh, the protectress of all these cities of the Etruscans as well. Then you have next, this is fun, uh, you have Sel or Kel, the Etruscan earth goddess, uh, identified with Ge, Ge. Uh, and of course, uh, that's another, again, uh, earth goddess. Now, what I think is interesting here uh, is that. Uh, is Sel is also the goddess of vegetation. So she is a goddess. And you can see how, how she is. Um, she is also mentioned as a sun goddess in many sources. And it is clear that Kel or Sel is connected to Ceres, Ceres who is the grain goddess uh, of, the, um, of the Romans. Again, I think that's interesting right there. So mother cell, uh, and there you have it. Uh, by the way, cell or kel appears on the liver that I mentioned from Byzantia. Uh, she is placed in house number 13, if you're curious. Uh, so there you have it. Now, she's also a goddess of the underworld connected to the interpretation of various omens. And you have <laughs> Lauren. Finally, you have a war god, right? Yeah, war god. Wait, is it? No, it's Etruscan. So I'm going to ruin it for you. <laughs> so now Lauren is a god of war. He portrayed as a naked youth wearing a helmet and carrying a spear. But uh, Lauren is associated with fire and the sun. However, um, it is his responsibility oh, you love this, to maintain peace. <laughs> Wait, he's a war god. Yeah, but his job is to keep the peace. So he's kind of an anti-war, war god. <laughs> I told you these people are great. <laughs> so it's, it's like, okay, so, you know, the idea is we want less of it, not more of it. All right. Then you have uh, Turin. She's goddess of love, fertility, 
and vitality. Uh, and she's usually depicted as a young winged girl. Uh, she is, um, it's interesting because uh, many of the Etruscan deities are des described as having wings. Uh, Turin was also viewed as the mistress, but sometimes she's called Mother Turin as well. And she is the spirit of love and happiness. Now, we do get, um, you know, in Greek and Roman literature, we, you, you do get goddesses connected with love, and yes, they want you happy. But the Etruscans had figured out that, no, 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 we want this, this love and happiness, love as happiness, as opposed to just sex and, and, and marriage and, you know, procreation. We want this friendly, happy, just love and bliss. I, again, I'm thinking, oh, this is pretty great. Turin, right? Okay, so we move right on. We got, uh, oh, huh, this is a lovely name, Fulfins. Fulfins, this is the god of plant life, but also the god of happiness, health, growth, and wine. You're going to get this point pretty soon that a lot of the gods of, we're gonna, I want to go through enough of them so I make my point really clear, but you're going to do this idea that the Etruscans really are into happy gods and goddesses, you know, and I, and I figure just me saying that is not enough, so I want to give you evidence of that, if that makes any sense. So Fulfins, plant life, happiness, wine, health, you know, all that. Uh, Manfer, which is connected later on to uh, Merva, is the goddess of wisdom. Uh, she is the goddess of arts. As I said, she will become the goddess Minerva, uh, connected to crafts and trade guilds. She's also uh, connected to Athena. But, but Merva is considered a goddess of healing. In fact, uh, there's a temple in Vey that uh, where she was worshipped along with Artemis and Apollo, and excavations have found uh, a basin uh, that had a pipe to receive the local sulfurous water, which cons was considered medicinal uh, in many ways. But she was a god of, of healing. So there you have that. Um, Murta, again, was, was pretty, pretty good, depicted like Athena in many ways, long chitin, carrying a spear and a shield. Uh, but uh, but unlike unlike Minerva, uh, the Etruscans give her nice broad wings. There you have it. There's lots of they like they like wings. You know, you have Losna. Uh, this is the Etruscan goddess of the moon. Yes, the, the the moon is a goddess, and connected to obviously Luna. Uh, she is the one who is lucid. She is the twilight, and there's lots of stories connected to her. You have Selvens, who is the god of, of boundaries. Uh, you have Kai Cacilia, or Kai Cacilia, also known as Gaia Cacilia, who is a Roman goddess of fire, the hearth, hearth, excuse me, healing and women. Uh, she is actually connected uh, to the famous queen, Carnacle, the wife of Parthenus Priscus that I mentioned. You know, the one that saw the eagle. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, take off uh, his hat and said, hey, he's going to be the next king of Rome. Well, guess what happens? She was considered such a wise woman, uh, very intelligent and well-educated, knew, you know, medicine and mathematics and augury and prophecy that they made her into a goddess. What? Yeah, <laughs> she became a goddess. Uh, so there you have it. It was worshipped as such. Uh, and as, uh, so she became a goddess of women. In fact, she played a part in the Roman, Roman wedding ceremony later on as part of the ritual. The bride and groom exchanged similar vows. And so what happens is the bride would, would say, where you are, Gaius, I am Gaia. And the groom would, of course, say, where you are, Gaia, I am Gaius. And of course, this basically means when you are happy, I am happy. And one becomes the other. And she's connected 
uh, to these ideas and it continued on. Oh, you, you probably saw this one coming. Guess who the goddess of gardens happened to be with the Etruscans? That's right, Horta, as in horticulture. <laughs> That's right, Horta. Uh, she's, uh, and so uh, connected to gardens. And uh, move right on here. Oh, I'm loving this one. I'm gonna let me make sure I unpack this really well. You also have Zipanu. Zipanu is the Etruscan goddess of beauty and love and is associated with Turin, the love goddess. Uh, Zipanu's name means brilliant or a flash, right? Now, uh, she is one of many of these attendants of love in connection to Turkon. In fact, we do have an image of her. She appears on an engraved mirror, the back of an engraved mirror, attending the preparation uh, for the divine bride by the name of Maladisk, uh, who is the Etruscan goddess of love. While Tur Turan oversees, she and another goddess by the name of Muntuk, who is the Etruscan love god and goddess of health, attend this Mulavisk, while there is nearby Hintail, the ghost or spirit of the individual that every person possessed, which stands behind them in the mirror. Now, uh, Muntuk who we'll talk about in a few seconds. He does Malavisk's makeup. And, Zip, and, and Zipu, or Zipandu, uh, works on her hair or crown. And uh, so and taking a look at her, we description-wise, Zipu is beautifully dressed, this particular goddess of beauty and love. Uh, how is she dressed? She has a headband. She has earrings. She has necklace and bracelets, as well as uh, intricate open work sandals. Uh, she wears uh, a transparent chitun, which shows every contour of her body. <laughs> uh, and uh, nothing really is concealed. Uh, so she's very beautiful. And so there you have that. So we do have an idea of what she looks like. Muntuk, as I said, uh, was also the other attendant. And I said before that she is the Etruscan love goddess and goddess of health. I just love, they're so positive here. Muntuk's name means elegance. He certainly looks it. Uh, and is related to the Etruscan word, munt, which means adornment. The word munt also means order. It also means honoring. And so the word Muntu can mean one who polishes. Now, let's have some fun. The word, right? Muntu is connected to the Latin word mundus. So Muntu, which means elegance, it means order, it means adornment, is connected to mundus which of course in Latin means the world or the universe in a sense that which is all encompassing, but which carries additional meaning of ornament or decoration. So the Greeks too uh, had a word that shared the same dual meaning. For example, cosmos, meaning order or world or order, uh, could also mean beauty, female adornment or the universe from which we get, of course, the word cosmetics, <laughs> like the Latin. And so uh, the related definitions share the underlying concept of righteousness and good order. Now, where am I going to go with this? Does this mean that when the ancients of the classical world looked at a beautiful woman, they saw the proper order of the universe? When one puts on one's makeup and one's hair, is it the ordering of, in a sense, the universe, that which is connected to Mother Earth, the Earth, 
because however the world remember is understood as female as the great mother earth who nourishes and takes care of her children and so we just have this fascinating rabbit trail that i love going through <laughs> and you can see that uh, so women when you're doing your makeup just think of yourself as mother earth and you're ordering the world in a beautiful way as you do your face and you adorn yourself with the clothes. Does that make sense? There it is. Now, of course, we have Nortia. Uh, she is a goddess of fate, uh, similar to the goddess Fortuna. I wish I could talk more about her. You also have Lhasa. Lhasa is an Etruscan fate goddess who is also connected to Turin, the Etruscan goddess of love. You're going, wow, this Etruscan goddess of love, Turin is so important, but love and fate? Yes, she is usually drawn as a beautiful winged goddess, nude, completely nude, but except for jewelry and boots. And this is this particular goddess of love, another one who is, uh, who's actually, she's a fake goddess of love. Fate, not fake, fate. F-A-T-E. Now, it's interesting because Lhasa, many scholars will say Lhasa uh, is the name of a goddess, but also you have those known as the Lhasai. And these are the attendants, those who attend Turin, the Etruscan goddess of love. And of course, they all have these big wings. <laughs> but what I like about the Lhasai is that what happens? You got you got, so you got the goddess of love, right? You got the goddess of love there, and you have the Lhasai who attend. And what they do is they specialize in different aspects of love. So one will go love and fate. You know, one will go, one will focus on love and beauty. Another Lhasai will focus on love and death. What? Yes. So, uh, well, so, you have, so you have the main goddess of love there, right? Turkon and her attendants micromanage. <laughs> they focus in aspects of love in a more specific way. So there you have it. So you got fate, you got, you know, you know, got death. So there you have it. In fact, you take a look and you examine Lhasa as well as a Lhasai, and they're not... They're not scary goddesses at all. They're so well balanced with this love aspect, and yet they're connected to what are usually are feared by most humans, fate and death, right? But it shows that the underworld is not a place of, of dread. In fact, uh, there is, um, in fact, what happens is that the idea of love or the attendance of love sometimes goes with the individual into the underworld. What? Wow. Yes. So there you have, oh, there's also the Etruscan, a god of fate and fame. Uh, her name is Mean, but she's not mean at all. She's quite nice. <laughs> uh, you have Alma, uh, who is the goddess of childbirth. Uh, you have Etsuva, who's a trusted goddess of childbirth and midwifery. Uh, so, and then you have um, Kupra, who's a goddess, uh, who a great, another great goddess, um, a goddess of fertility and the earth, mothers and giving. You notice there's a connection here. We keep mentioning goddesses, and there's a lot of. You're going. Wait a minute, Doctor Rifo, stop here. Is it just me, or is there is there more goddesses than gods in the Etruscans? You, you kind of noticed that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, you, you got more Etruscan female deities than you have male. Again, this is a leftover from an earlier age. And I find it absolutely beautiful, right? So uh, there you have that. Okay, so then we have Vamp. I, I want to make sure we get the Vamp. Vamp uh, is the Etruscan goddess of the underworld, kind of a cycle pop. Uh, her presence indicates the, re the recent or impending death. Uh, she does appear with big wings like an angel. And she's beautiful. <laughs> but she stands on the threshold of death. And we see her all over the Etruscan tombs. 
Uh, she is an integral part of their idea of crossing over to the other side. Sometimes, I love this, her, her wings are painted with eyes, maybe representing the all-seeing and inevitable aspect of death. And she, of course, uh, is there not only as you pass, but she, in a sense, is almost like a guardian angel. Uh, she appears on the other side with you, taking you uh, to the other side. Now, she does have a partner. <laughs> and I probably should talk about the partner. The partner is Karun, who's the Etruscan version of the Greek Chera. Uh, and he was the guardian who ferries souls over to the other side of the River Styx. You know that one? Well, yeah. So uh, what happens is that he doesn't look as good as Bam. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. Um, so, in fact, uh, he looks... Uh, uh, he looks kind of scary, uh, to be honest. Honest. Uh, uh, he guards the entrance of the underworld. He's depicted with a hammer, which is his religious symbol. He's shown with pointed ears, so Star Trek fans like that. Uh, he has snakes around his arms. Uh, he looks. He's he's color blue because it kind of shows a you know death. You know you're turning blue. Uh, sometimes he has enormous wings too uh but sometimes uh he does have a black beard and he looks kind of you know his face looks kind of scary and monstrous uh, to the point where he kind of looks like a gargoyle you know you see uh on the french cathedrals looking out yeah so many have said he's kind of apotropaic he wards off evil just by his expression and so you have this beautiful vamp, and then you have this very kind of scary charun, and this is this is the underworld. Now, he he has. Um, what's interesting is that um, he does carry. We see the sarcophagi, uh, this hammer, uh, and the idea. In fact, he's shown about to hit the hammer sometimes on a person's head. So this this idea is when you die, you're clocked. <laughs> and you go to the other side, but it's not a bad thing, you know. It's just like it's the it's the you know. And so you are, in a sense, dispatched. So you have a dispatch, which is fascinating because later on, the Romans, the Romans brutalize this virgin. And so what happens is after the during the gladiatorial fights, the big fight going on, and uh, it turns out that the um, you know it looks to me that the person is. Uh, uh, is, 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 is injured, he's going to die, uh, and the other yeah, gladiator doesn't want to do the death nail moment, doesn't want to do it. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll say dispatch, and this guy will come out with a big hammer and take out that person who is suffering. Well, that's kind of a gruesome remnant of this, but, the, but it doesn't seem as dark and dreary, uh, but uh, you know, uh, but there you have it. You also have a Hades character uh, known as Tukulcha. And Tukulcha, I love the name. T-U-C-H-U-L-C-H-A. Tukulcha. Uh, he is um, he's the Hades character. He has also pointed ears. So if you're underworld, you got pointed ears. Uh, but it kind of looks like donkey ears to me when I look at it. The hair is made out of snakes. Uh, he has a peak of a vulture, right? So he does look rather monstrous, again, akin to Charon. And so, you know, you also have Kulsu, who is an Etruscan goddess of the underworld. And uh, in fact, she is a goddess of the, the gates of the underworld. Uh, she has many different names. Uh, one is Tukuhuka, which means she who coils or she who winds up. So in a sense that she is understood as snake-like and warrior-like. And yet um, we also have Alpanu. Alpanu uh, is the Etruscan goddess of the underworld. She is shown wearing jewelry, a loose cloak and sandals. And she uh, is, or she, sometimes she's just naked. Uh, and she is the goddess of sexual activity. What? 
wait, you know, I heard you, but then I did, and I want you to stop now. But wait, wait, what? Wait, Alpanu is the trusting goddess of the underworld and sexual activity? Yeah. But what, what there's sexual activity in the underworld? Of course. <laughs> but also, a sexual activity uh, is understood to give fertility that moves up through the soil into the crops. Oh, that's beautiful. It is, isn't it? Yeah. So she wears, uh, has these big wings. Her name, Alpanu, means gift or offering or willingness. And, uh, and she is portrayed again, naked, free of clothing. Uh, but she's also depicted as a love goddess, you know. And so she is sometimes shown as holding a bouquet of flowers or leaves. Alpanu. So I think that's a goddess we need to have more depictions of. What do you think, right? Think of the underworld, you think of Alpanu there. Uh, you have others too. Um, you, of course, the Hintao, uh, a trusting god who also connects to our soul. We all have a soul or a shadow or apparition within us. Uh, and then, of course, you have uh, a the god, death goddess, Linth, of, who's of old age. But these are all just pretty pretty positive in so many different ways. You do have goddesses um, who, uh, well, actually, I should say, we're not sure. You have uh, Nathan, who is uh, also known as, basically has indeterminate, sometimes shown as having been male, and sometimes shown as being female. And so being both. So you have this this gender neutral aspect. In fact, you have quite a, not just one, but you have a few of those as well. And of course, I find that fascinating. In fact, as we go through all these goddesses, I'm glad I had a chance. I couldn't tell you everything. As we go through all these gods and goddesses, because we are concluding, because we need to. But I think you see a pattern, don't you? You're seeing that the orientation of the Etruscans, the way they saw gender, the way they saw nature, the way they saw daily life was different than the Romans after them. And in many cases, are remnants of Bronze Age cultures, such as the Minoans, where there is a love of just living each and every day to its highest potential. And I think the best way to see a culture, I want, I want to go here. The best way to see a culture is how they view death. You walk into an Etruscan tomb and you see depictions of the underworld and you realize they see death as a beautiful place, a place where there's no suffering, there's peace, and there's love. And that speaks well for them. Thank you so much. That's it. <laughs> you guys enjoy that? Was that fun? Yes. It was great. Oh, any questions? Would you say About that it's more pages. Huh? Huh? Dr. Reitfeld, would you say that it's because they were more matriarchal than patriarchal? Yeah. So, good. I'm glad you're, so glad you're asking this question. You know, what I find is interesting about the Etruscans is that when they go into their legacies, oftentimes they mention their father and their mother's name. So both, both lineages, uh, both the, the, the father's lineage and the mother's lineage, uh, is is important. So you d you do see that it is it is a more of an egalitarian society, and you could see that not only through depictions uh, in their artwork. You not only see that uh, you know you know in uh, in the in the way they have their gods and and the, and the kinds of functions they perform, right? But also you see that even in the gossip against them. You see the fact that they're being made fun of by these other cultures because they are so free with their lives 
with their sexuality, with the idea of esteeming women as equal in many ways to men. Now, this will get this will change as time goes on, but Etruscans initially are a remnant of these earliest civilizations, like you saw with the Minoans. You, know, you have this sense of women are doing the same kinds of jobs as men, uh, even even having the job of in political leadership, even being involved in city councils. And, uh, and, and of course, I didn't mention this, but uh, I made a reference to it, but even sitting side by side with men at the banqueting halls, uh, drinking and laughing and having conversation, we see that not only in the writings, we see that in the depictions and art. And you're seeing the fluidity of relationships as well. Uh, you see, yes, husband, wife, it's very important, but you see also uh, very much an openness uh, when it comes to gender. Uh, you have women, uh, female love to love, men love to love. And then you even have this neutrality, which is interesting that you see uh, even reflected in their deities. You have gods that don't have any gender go in between. And I, again, it's just amazing. And I think that needs to be studied more, but it's not. That's fascinating um, because for me, patriarchy brings in possession. Mm -hmm. And that's why when women were seen as possessions, whereas it looks like the Etruscans didn't see women as possessions. No, co-owners. We're suffering from that even right now. You know, we're just a possession that can have their rights removed. So yes. yeah, it, it continues on, but it was wonderful to see that there was a civilization where women were just equal. Well, yeah, and, and what really impresses me is, and I mean, I could go on forever, and I did, but impresses me is all the goddesses of love. You know, they, were, they weren't satisfied with one. You know? just, I, think I, I think I listed about 10, it was about 10 <laughs> of goddesses. It's like, wow, I mean, who, who does that? <laughs> the Etruscans, and I, I, you know, and all it's not just the typical love for procreation reasons. You know, it's not just the 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 eros kind of love. You know, you, of course, you have the agape kind of love there, intertwined, and, and of course, you know, and of course, obviously, the others too as well. Oh, it's Virgin. You see that there, but you see, you have such a uh, of course phileo, but you have other kinds of love too. And it, the idea is happiness, love, and happiness are are put together. And you don't see that as much amongst the Greeks or Romans. You do see it. I had seen it in a case like Artemis of the Ephesians in Asia Minor. But you don't, it's not as often. And you, when you think of Aphrodite or Venus, you think of a different kind of love, don't you? You know, but this is just, we want you happy. <laughs> Let's enjoy life. Even Let's enjoy death. good food, and good drink, and good company. And even in death, apparently, with their tombs, it's all about happiness. It's all about happiness. And you got this vamp right. goddess that follows you to the other side. And, and, and you, you, go into, you go into these tombs, and it's like, look at this. It's a celebration. And I, I tell you, that, that shows the strength of that society, that uh, death is not, nothing to be afraid of, but it's something to look forward to. It's not a threat. That's great. Thank you. It was You're wonderful. Welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? Makes you want to look up some of these goddesses, right? You know, to uh, look into them and explore them a little bit further. Hopefully, you know, I, I, I got you a little bit curious on these. Uh, thank you, Laurel. Um, um, and for, for your nice message about it's a testament to how interesting it was that I and just stay awake this long. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad I kept people awake. So it's a good keeping you awake at night kind of situation. So, so hopefully uh, you are surrounded uh, by these love deities. <laughs> and certainly a lot of them. So um, any other questions? All right, we will bring it to a close. And next time we will be talking about Pollyanna Satiana. So stay tuned. This is another great fun talk. So until then, thank you so much for being here. 
uh, and have a great night.